Yeah, okay. is that okay? So we've started recording again. Yeah, so please, Erika, whenever you're ready, please uh, fire away. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks, Lindy, for this really inspiring talk. I already have a lot of comments and questions. I'll continue. Maybe we could continue the conversation in one of those uh, uh, fora uh, on, online at some point. I'll also share a PowerPoint, which I put together very quickly and far, uh, far from being as well designed as Lindsay's. I really loved how you uh, interwove both uh, in terms of your work and also in the practice, your uh, uh, your uh, profession. Okay, let me just see how this will work. Uh, can you see my screen? Life languages and academia. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so this, uh, this is the title I gave, so I'm somewhat desperate to my talk, A Journey Across Europe, because for me, languages and work and life are uh, so intricately intertwined, as we also got from, from Lindy's story. I could call this a love story or a, or a road movie. Uh, very quickly, I will rush you my story here, so it's really my personal perspective uh, on how it happened in my case, and also some conclusions that I'll try to... Uh, draw from it. So, from in this episode of of today, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about how and why I started uh, a number of languages and which languages, and how I also stopped some of them, uh, which I also think we have to acknowledge uh, does exist, and it's not necessarily always a bad thing or a thing that you need to worry about. Uh, and how I and when where I ended up using some of those languages and uh, what there is to take away from this story. So a very quick uh, uh, introduction. So you get a picture of oh, oops, sorry about the the whole thing here. Kezdetben való magyar. So I am Hungarian uh, by origin. I was born in Hungary. I started my university studies there. And then, and then this happened. I tried to reproduce kind of my my uh, journey in the past about 20, 25 years, and this is something uh, like uh, what it's what it's been. <laughs> uh, so I started in, in in Hungary, started my studies there, and then I ended up uh, getting a, a scholarship uh, to finish my PhD in Aberdeen in Scotland, but not nothing related to Scottish or or. Uh, uh, anything British or English speaking. I actually did a PhD in French. Uh, and then uh, I spent some time in Paris. I had an Erasmus year before going to Aberdeen in Poitiers. Uh, and then and then some journey after my PhD uh, until I ended up settling in Lancaster on my current job. So this journey included a postdoc uh, in Hamburg in Germany and uh, a temporary job at Oxford. So this kind of not to go through all the details here, but so you can see kind of there's a, a mess of countries here. Oh, and I lived in Malta for a while as well. And that was was so partly for for uh, work and partly for private life, but not for academic uh, work. So these are just uh, some elements to give you an idea about the kind of linguistic contexts I, I, I've lived in. Uh, and uh, uh, partly languages took, took me to countries and partly countries have taken me to languages as well. Uh, so I try to reproduce kind of the chronology of, uh, of my language learning here. And first was after my Hungarian, there was actually more or less first uh, there was English, which I started learning with the song, the Muffin Man in, in some uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, in my hometown, and then it ended up taking me to a uh, university where I didn't actually study English for uh, for a degree, but it kind of kept accompanying me because it was necessary <laughs> in a way. It was uh, indispensable, and also it somehow ended up being one of the three key languages in my life. But so I never got a degree in it, and I felt, I always felt that I never went to the end of the English language and properly studying it. But since it became so important and I ended up writing books and my thesis in it, uh, it did sort of in a way uh, took over uh, in my life, even though the language I actually did, went on to, did uh, go on to study was Le Francais, uh, which is the other main language that has been accompanying me. Uh, so I started my French 
in secondary school because I had a choice between among French and Russian and German. And this was the most attractive to me. And also because Russian was still the language of the enemy at the time, we are talking about 25 years ago now. Uh, and, and because German was so crunchy and I didn't like it so much. So I, I ended up choosing French. Also because uh, I already loved literature. Uh, and I wanted to study literature further. And sort of when I started French at age 14, one of my main objective was to be able to read Balzac, one of the big 19th century uh, authors, novelists in French, in the original language. And I was very pleased when that started to happen. And this kind of motivation actually accompanied my life. I, I always loved literature and reading and, and being able to read in, in the languages I started to learn or being able to read the, an author I loved in the language that they, they wrote in was one of my key motivations. In addition to obviously other motivations of being able to travel to a country and talk to people and, uh, and uh, become closer to them by to, uh, talking to them in the language. Uh, and I also went on to study uh, French at university partly for, for very kind of basic and, and not so perhaps not, not so, uh, um, how shall I say it, elegant reasons. I did love French, but it, it was also true that uh, uh, many people chose Engli English at the time to go to university and I just felt like, oh, everyone's doing English. I don't want to do the same thing. Uh, and because uh, there would be so many English teachers, uh, it would be more difficult to, uh, to get by perhaps. So let me do something else. And so French was more interesting in many levels. Uh, and so it also happened that uh, English somehow inter kind of got interwoven with my in my French, and I still uh, ended up living in English speaking countries more than French speaking ones throughout my life. Uh, so it it happens uh, that uh, you know you choose a language and kind of others take over for for uh, different reasons, uh, and that's just I guess life. So I. I did study French for a degree at university. English was there on and off, sort of uh, uh, accompanying me without, without being very formalized or very structured. But then while I was at university, I also uh, had an opportunity to start Italian. Italian? I, I got a, a sort of a weird sound feedback there. I hope you can hear me properly. Is that okay? It's fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. So I, so I started uh, learning Italian also for uh, reasons more or less uh, personal, for fun, and because it was there and it was free, and we had, uh, we had at university had, uh, some extra free language classes. And also because additionally, I, I felt like uh, going on uh, and uh, trying for a PhD in French, but having a language exam uh, in another language gave extra points to getting a PhD scholarship as well. So you had also additional motivation there. I think that wasn't a bad uh, system to, to encourage people to, to, to start and learn languages. And obviously, well, Italian was just so beautiful and, and attractive. And I also wanted to go to Italy and I also wanted to read again uh, Italian authors. So my method of learning was much less systematic than, uh, than Lindy's, but uh, uh, basically anything I could get hold of at the time. So again, this was um, about 20, 21 years ago now. There, I, I didn't have so, such easy access to, to the web back then, but we had a small Italian library at university and I already loved Umberto Eco and, uh, and Antonio Tabucchi. And then I, uh, and then I discovered Alessandro Baricco, another author. So anything I could get hold of, I was just basically sitting there in the morning, sparing an hour before I start the day and going through my Umberto Eco 600 pages and I would get through three or four pages in the morning, but it doesn't matter, you know, I had the year to finish a book. Uh, and slowly sort of it, uh, it mobilized my, uh, the knowledge I was getting in the, the um, Italian classes where we were, learning uh, basic sentences like la mamba butta la pasta adesso and sort of things about food and travel that you would do. So there was like this combination between literature uh, that brings you to other topics. You needed to use a dictionary, but it doesn't matter. And then, and then you have, uh, you know, uh, someone to guide you through. So I think uh, having some sort of structure, but having extra motivation is always a good combination to, uh, to uh, 
uh, make progress with the uh, languages. And also, this is a point to make uh, that I, I think the difficulty shouldn't necessarily put one off. So if you don't understand everything, it's, it doesn't necessarily matter. It doesn't mean that you should stop, or it doesn't mean that you can't read the text because you don't understand every word of it. If you get the gist of it, and then you can, and you can accept that uh, imperfect knowledge or imperfect understanding, slowly, slowly, you know, you will get the stamina and, uh, and get farther and farther. So I went on uh, studying a couple of years of Italian in, in this way, and I was getting at a comfortable uh, level with it. But then uh, the Italian teacher I was taking classes from uh, couldn't continue anymore. But there was an opportunity to, to study some Spanish. So I went in to study Spanish. By that time, I actually had started my PhD. So my Italian strategy did work out, and I did get a scholarship. And I spent the year, first years of my um, doctoral studies actually uh, studying more languages and reading uh, other things in more languages uh, and also sort of just uh, doing stuff around around uh, the topic I was interested in for my PhD and, and beyond that. So, un po' de castellano. Uh, okay, so I just said it and again the books and the authors I loved by then were a great motivation and then I explored others. Uh, I must say that uh, I also went kind of the easy way by choosing Italian and Spanish after after my kind of more or less solid knowledge of, of French by then, because these are both Romance languages, so once you get the gist of the grammar and the structures, it really feels easy to learn the new ones, until the point where it gets really difficult to keep them separate, and this was part of my question to, to Lindy, how you manage to keep them separate. When you have three uh, very or two or three very similar languages, then it it, it just uh, it just really gets messy uh, for me anyway. Uh, between Italian and Spanish, it's always been a problem. Uh, when there I spend some time uh, in Italy speaking Italian, then it takes a little bit over, but then I speak for, for a while in, in Spanish and then I can't find the Italian in my head. Or there are these transferences uh, or interferences, which sometimes I can identify, but sometimes I can't. So I just will conjugate a verb uh, uh, in the Spanish way and, um, when I'm speaking Italian or the other way around. So these are tricky things, but obviously it doesn't necessarily stop you from trying and people will generally understand you anyway. So again, one point is that not to get too uh, fussy about making mistakes. It's important to, that you accept to, to make mistakes and that you're not uh, perfect because otherwise, you know, it's more difficult to progress. So those two kind of uh, uh, intersectional uh, and then sort of interzone languages. Uh, which keeps serving in my life, but I haven't actually uh, had a job with them. But they also helped me uh, make sort of a difference in my studies and my in my PhD research, for instance, because I was able to read much more widely than if I had just known French and uh, uh, and English. And I can cite uh, literature from from those languages. I think it's always been a plus that I am I have an overview of a much wider research. And I think this applies to any science that you do, even if scientists do tend to do uh, published research, more important research in, in English. I think you can always get an edge by being able to read what people do in their own language, in their own countries. And that might be even uh, more important for certain sciences in certain uh, countries, certain languages, when you have a of the most advanced research and there is a value in going to that country this or that research group you know that happens that also actually happened to me i'm oh, sorry uh with the german uh so the deutschens in the best of and i found when i went a little bit further into my uh, phd research which was on uh, the early uh, 20th century French author Marcel Proust, who was much inspired, among other things, by German philosophers of the 19th century, uh, and who was also much studied by German, uh, oops, sorry, my time coming close to the end, uh, was also much studied by uh, German uh, scholars, uh, who wrote the most interesting things actually about Proust and German philosophers. So I felt that it was very, it would be very useful for me to know German uh, in order again to have a, a sort of a distinctive edge uh, for my research. So I went on studying um, 
uh, German in tandem uh, in a language exchange with a friend. Well, a friend I found who wanted to study French. So we just gave each other classes and then we worked on, on our own. And she went on with her French with my help and I went on with my uh, German with her help. Uh, and so uh, I, I never felt that I really got my head around the German because it has such a different structure and logic than, than the languages that I, I already felt familiar with and those are the Rom Romance languages. But it was still incredibly useful for me to be able to read. Uh, and it uh, most importantly, perhaps, also helped me get a, a political position, which was a, a great opportunity for me to uh, uh, to go on to uh, study in Hamburg, even though it wasn't an actual, um, uh, it wasn't an actual prerequisite that you know German. I think uh, the, the the German uh, evaluators certainly appreciated some some knowledge of uh, of German, and I had to hand in my PhD thesis also, which had uh, quotations in German. So these uh, uh, things, even indirectly, I think, make links for you. And somehow, and this uh, and just one point uh, to one of the previous questions or discussions about how you uh, you study a language and how you get tested on a language. I never felt entirely, you know, uh, comfortable in German, but I had a two months intensive course in the Goethe Institute at the beginning of my postdoc that was offered by the Humboldt Foundation. They are really great at uh, at getting scholars uh, into German. And and a quite uh, uh, you know in a, in a, in a quite uh, uh, objective way try to work my German up to 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 a decent level, but also targeting a, a language exam, and and I knew the kind of exercise it would uh, it would uh, require, and I had a certain experience in learning languages and passing language exams, so I quite uh, uh, purposefully targeted certain types of. Uh, uh, certain type of language and certain types of exercises, which meant that I did manage to get that uh, C1 with the surprisingly good results. I still don't feel that uh, that my my uh, current level, uh, even now and even then, <laughs> would really live up to that level. But anyway, you can do that. So even if, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of strategic way, you try to work your language up to a certain level, uh, you can find very good targeted tools for that. Okay, very quickly, languages I haven't ended up learning. There are a couple of them. Kotkiot Malako, I, I mentioned that Russian was the language of the enemy. I still had to do two years of it because I was, uh, I, I'm old enough that I was born in Eastern Bok and it was compulsory, but uh, the cat is drinking me. It is about the only sentence that's uh, that I'm left with after two years. It also means that the teaching wasn't good and I didn't have the motivation. Then uh, I started Maltese because uh, uh, at some point in my life, I met a person who was Maltese and I moved to Malta, uh, but everyone spoke English and I was looking for a job at the time and I had my PhD to publish, etc. So there were just too many other things and too little motivation in the end because everyone spoke English. So if I had stayed on in Malta, probably I would have I would have uh, uh, ended up learning the language, but uh, you know, there was just no space for it in life at that point. Uh, oh, and another thing is because in the book that I actually started learning Maltese from, this third lesson was something about uh, God and how he, uh, he governs everything in the world. And I think that was kind of a cultural clash, which I couldn't uh, get over, and I never, read, never went farther than that. Okay, obrigada. Portuguese I started at some point, and I'm still motivated to do, but again, there was just no space in my life and in my head for it so far. And, and uh, Chinese, which I also started at some point, but uh, again, lack of space and, uh, uh, and time. And, and the languages I'm, I'm still learning, but um, all of the above, uh, one of my big issues uh, is how to maintain all of them. Well, uh, German, Italian, Spanish, which I'm using much less. I'm trying to read, just like uh, Lindsay said, you can find a little strategies to integrate them in your life. And I do love to listen to things, except my problem is that Every language I speak in my everyday life is a foreign language, so I need to somehow find a space for, for all, all of them. And I find myself forgetting my mother tongue. So my research is now actually uh, orienting a little bit uh, back towards my mother tongues, so I don't forget that. Uh, that's perhaps an actual risk when you, when you live abroad for, for a while. Uh, and then another kind of kettle, uh, different kettle of fish, I think, is the programming languages, which I am studying at the moment, thanks to the EPSRC's very generous support. And I think it's an excellent way of sort of uh, uh, trying to 
think out and beyond the box that you are used to and uh, and uh, going beyond uh, my zone, comfort zone uh, because I'm used to studying human languages but uh, uh, machine languages I think underpin everything that we do today and we have so little understanding of, uh, of them while the younger generations perhaps will now start studying it at school as a, as a basis but there is a generational gap between between us so it's a different kind of exercise. They are much less forgiving than the other languages, than the human languages are, because if you just miss uh, one letter or one comma or, or one space, then, then nothing will happen and just get error messages. And I find it far, far more frustrating than the uh, than learning of human languages. Uh, but you know, it's the daily struggle today and, uh, and this different logic and a different perception of the world to learn. Okay, so very quickly, why and how to learn languages. I think uh, opportunities that you meet in your life, they are, uh, they are often excellent and, uh, uh, and I am for taking as many of them as, uh, as possible. Uh, and it also depends on what opportunity for what language you actually meet. Uh, as Lindy very nicely emphasized, combining language with your passion, with your interest is uh, definitely a key and very important way of, uh, uh, of moving on and, and making progress with your languages. Then meeting with people to motivate you to learn a language, be it friend, love, uh, you know, uh, work, uh, anything, you will immediately find that uh, just a couple of words that you learn in their language uh, makes bridges that you that you can't uh, create otherwise. Uh, people uh, mean network, network for work, network for, for life. Uh, it sort of uh, embraces everything, all the rest of it, I think. Uh, you get work through network and work brings you to networks, but your networks should be much more interesting through languages. Uh, and adventure, uh, and I think one of the most interesting things in language learning is the adventures that can open you to both mentally and uh, stuff, uh, geographically. Uh, I, I could tell you uh, what I want. <laughs> Examples of how you, know, you start realizing things simply because a different language puts a, a different word in a different way and cuts up reality in a different way. And you just start thinking, oh, right, that's right, that's how it is. Uh, and so what language should you learn? Well, any that you get a chance of and you get interested in, I think whatever you, you go for, it will only make you richer in some way. So that's me, and sorry, I took a little more time than I was supposed to, and it was probably more speedy than, than uh, it would have been ideal, but uh, that's kind of my life and language is summed up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one very quick question and one very quick answer. Anyone in the chat want to raise that answer? No, in that case, I'll ask just one very quick question. If you could give one piece of advice to somebody who wants who, a linguist, um, yes, a linguist who wants to learn a uh, programming language, what would it be? Hmm. Good question. Uh, one single advice. I guess one, one thing, I don't know if that's an advice, but one, one thing I definitely learned is that it's not, a, it's not just a question of uh, syntax or learning the sort of words or elements in a language but it's getting the logic of the thing right first so uh, if you look at several uh, programming languages they often have a very similar logic in any case if they belong to the same paradigm they have a similar logic but you need to understand the way in which uh, uh, that logic uh, functions how you <laughs> how, how functions function how uh, variables function how far that goes so uh, there is a different logic to it that you need to understand that's in a way that in a way has nothing to do with with the way human languages function but uh, uh, but which is the basis for all these languages and okay. then you need to be very precise in the in the syntax <laughs> afterwards but yeah okay thank you very much and uh, we'll uh, stop recording now and then we'll